Hello, and welcome to the Wharton Hungarian Presbyterian Church. We are located at 83 Robert Street in Wharton, New Jersey. Sunday worship service is held at 10, 15 a.m. We pray that you can be with us in person, but if not, it's great you're with you on YouTube. Uh, just remember to click on that subscribe and like buttons so we gain wider view viewership. Today's the 10th Sunday, June 9th, 2024. Now for the call to worship. Come and worship, all you who love and serve our God. He who surrounds us with unfailing love and answers us when we call. Who cares for the humble and lowly and never abandons those in need. This is our God, worthy of our worship and praise. Amen. As we prepare to listen to what the Bible is saying to us, let us bow our heads for the prayer of illumination. Send your spirit among us, O God, as we meditate on your love. Prepare our minds to hear your word. Move our hearts to embrace what we hear and strengthen our will to follow your way. This we pray through Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our Old Testament scripture reading today is taken from Psalm, chapter 138, verses 1 through 8. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. When I called, you answered me. You greatly emboldened me. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. May they sing in the ways of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretched out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you saved me. The Lord will vindicate me. Your love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. This is the word of the Lord. The psalmist David writes in this chapter of the theme of praising, giving thanks, and worshiping God. David was the youngest of seven brothers with at least two sisters. When the Lord wanted a new king to replace King Saul, David was the chosen one. As the youngest son, it was David's job to be shepherd over his father's flock of sheep. But God, in his infinite wisdom, took a simple shepherd out of the field and made him king over the sheep of Israel. He went from the humble job of being a shepherd to the glory of being a king. But David didn't look at being a king as full of glory. He was humble by being God's chosen king over God's people. We see that throughout the book of Psalms. In the, in the Old Testament times, kings were looked upon as gods, but David gave all credit to God. This reading takes a turn from speaking of a kingly rank to saying that the Lord looks kindly on the lowly. In God, there is unfailing love and great faithfulness, even in the midst of our lack of faith and disobedience. Majestic is God's compassion and mercy. We read in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. This should have a big effect 
on all of us in our daily living as we are living to praise God with our whole hearts. We should, of course, do this with words of prayer, but we should also praise God through our actions in the world. People around us observe not only how we speak, but through deeds and conduct. We must display God's love in our lives by our actions. That is how we daily praise God with our whole heart, not just on Sunday. We do this day in and day out. Jesus told his disciples as recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Like David, the disciples didn't warrant words of praise. All glory is to the Father. So when people praise us or pat us on the back and say, what a good job you've done, we must realize that it is God who has put faith in our hearts. And it is this faith that is the light that shines from us, a light of praise and glory to and for God. We should look to the great prophet and leader, Moses, as an example of how to conduct ourselves. We read about him in the book of Numbers. Now Moses was a very humble man, more humble than anyone else on the face of the earth. We can look back to all the Bible stories of different times when the Lord has preserved David. He began as a shepherd boy who was anointed as king over Israel. Saul was the first king and David would become the second. While Saul was still king, David was given the honor of living in the palace. Even though David played the harp to calm Saul's, uh, Saul's troubled spirit, Saul tried to kill him a number of times. But the Lord preserved David. Finally, David becomes king. He sins by committing adultery with Bathsheba and then has Bathsheba's husband Uriah placed in the front line of the battle with orders for the other soldiers to retreat. Uriah was killed. He commits both adultery and murder. The Lord then sends the prophet Nathan, who spoke to David. There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who would come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared for the one who would come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel and Judah. And if this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord 
by doing what is evil in his eyes. You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him by the sword of the Ammonites. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But because by doing this, you have shown utter contempt for the Lord, the son born to you will die. David receives the ultimate punishment that can come to a human. He loses his own child. But David doesn't lose his soul for eternity. David sees God's hand in his life once again. He mentions that here in verse number 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. David simply said, I have sinned. Nathan said, your sins are forgiven. In the depth of his disobedience, the Lord answered. The Lord preserved him through many battles, and the Lord had preserved him in his greatest battle of all, the battle against his own sinful flesh. But instead of destroying him forever, the Lord preserved him and saved David from hell. Despite David's totally despicable, abominable actions, God, out of his sovereign will, forgave David. Like David, even though we might commit an abhorrent sin, when we truthfully ask God for forgiveness, we can be assured that he will pardon us. When we look back in our life, we see the times that the Lord has preserved us in times of distress, in times of sickness, and in times of mourning. With his right hand, God slaps our back, slaps the back of our enemies that would attack us. With his right hand, he delivers us from the depths of despair, and he preserves us every day. And he preserves us during the good times as well. He is always with us, even if we don't recognize it. It is comforting to remind ourselves how concerned the Lord is about us, that he is all things working together for our good. The Lord knows each one of us by name. He knows what we want and need. Isaiah writes, before they call, I will answer. While they are still speaking, I will hear. Jesus taught his disciples not to worry. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. God never leaves us or forsakes us. He is faithful. God keeps us in the palm of his right hand, and he provides for us spiritually. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Our God is faithful. He knows what we are going to face. He provides a way out. He knows the temptations we're going to face. We face temptations that are not any different than our fellow believers also face. We read in Paul's epistle to the Hebrews, through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, 
the fruit of lips that openly profess his name. Jesus is the only way to eternal salvation, no matter what the world might teach, no matter what philosophers or deniers of the faith may say. It is only through Jesus that we know God's great love for us sinners. Through Jesus we are eternally saved. That is the reason for our worship. That is how we praise God with our whole heart, by confessing Jesus with our lips, because he lives in our hearts. If our God is always faithful and preserves us, then why do we still turn our backs on him? Because we're imperfect. We're selfish. We are lawbreakers. We are corrupt. We are sinners. We must, must remember Psalm 105, which tells us, Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Amen. The Holy Spirit enables us to confess Jesus as Lord. In doing so, we are acknowledging our total allegiance to and love for Jesus. Let us bow our heads for the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been Help us amend what we are and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Please take a minute to offer your own personal prayer of repentance for your sins, asking God for forgiveness. And now, if you'll repeat with me the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Gospel reading not a gospel reading, it's a New Testament reading. Sorry, New Testament reading is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13 through, 15, uh, 13 through chapter 5, verse 1. Let's start over. Our New Testament scripture reading today is taken from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 through chapter 5, verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All of this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, 
we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what we have seen is temporary, but what, we, what is unseen is eternal. But we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. This is the word of the Lord. My message is titled, Just Don't Waste the Way. The Apostle Peter writes in his second epistle about the Apostle Paul. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort. I hope that this message only pertains to the first part of that statement. I'll do my best not to distort Paul's difficult language. Some might view Paul's writing as gloomy, but it really isn't. It's a fact of life. He writes of the hope of our own resurrection, will encourage us in our daily life, in our day, in our day of suffering, and set us above the fear of death. The Lord gives us something to focus on, but it's invisible. It's focused on the future, the eternal. But how do we get here? We get there through faith in the death of Christ as payment for our sins. We get there through the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection is the means to that end. Jesus promised, because I live, you also will live. With this vision, we have a goal in life. We want to be in heaven with Jesus. We want others to be in heaven with us too. We know where we are going. We are focused on the future. That doesn't mean we don't think about the past. Without the past, we have no future. Jesus died for our sins in the past. So now we don't have to live with constant regret and sorrow over our past sins. God says that in the death of Jesus, he has forgotten those sins. So we can too. He rose from the dead in the past. Without that, we would have no future. We are grounded in the past we are not living in the past. Nor are we only living in the present. The present is important. We are to make the most of our time here. But we know that life is temporary. Some people constantly live from one thrill to the next, trying to get as much out of this life as possible, as if this is all they had. Then there are other people who are constantly depressed about how sad their life is. The resurrection changes all this. It's easy to lose sight of this and forget about how temporary this life is. This is the hope we are to speak about, Paul says. Since we have this, that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. This corresponds to what is written in Psalm 116, 1 and 2. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. The psalmist wrote about going through some turmoil in their life. He thought, he was going to die. And he said, 
I am great, greatly afflicted. But then he spoke with confidence in salvation through the Lord. He would walk before the Lord in the land of the living. The promise of eternal life gave him hope. He spoke up and made vows and sacrifices to the Lord. His promise of life enabled him to live and to speak and to praise the Lord, no matter what the circumstances. And that is what Paul says faith in the future does for us too. God speaks to us in order that we may speak to him and about him. Paul writes, as grace increases, it will overflow to the glory of God. As more and more people give thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 15 tells us, all of this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Paul is saying that God's grace increases when we speak of our hope in the resurrection, especially during trials. Paul had plenty to complain about. He was constantly being threatened to stop proclaiming the gospel. He was constantly being beaten and imprisoned. He could have easily gotten depressed and felt abandoned. But Paul, with a sure hope in the goal of heaven, never shut up about that hope. He kept on speaking. He wouldn't keep quiet. He couldn't keep quiet. Ultimately, the devil wants you to be quiet. He wants to intimidate you. He wants to shame you into silence. But when you speak up about your hope in Christ, God is glorified and it's infectious. More and more people will give thanks. Then we are discouraged when we are attacked or ridiculed for what we believe. But a part of that is that we need to speak up. Keep focused on the resurrection and it will change how you talk. The resurrection also changes the way we look at life. Paul writes in verses 16 through 18, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. God works through our deterioration on the outside. He wants us to cling to Him all the more on the inside. The more we decay, the more we will grow. Think about it an eternity in heaven. If you were to compare one year of, a, of life for a 10-year-old to one year of life for a 50-year-old, it just doesn't compare. Remember how slowly life seemed to go by when we were younger? Now the older you get, the faster life goes by. It's unbelievable how often I'm turning the pages of the calendar. The Apostle Paul uses a similar comparison when it comes to heaven. <clears throat> Our momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. God deals with disease and death in this world in a different way. He didn't immunize us or pretend that we could hide from it. He had it straight for it in order to conquer it. God takes us into a doctor's office and shows us Jesus. He says, look at him, stay focused on him and trust in him. Then you still go through death. You will end up in heaven. 
Jesus came to suffer our disease and face his awful death on the cross, rising from the dead to get us out of this world, not keep us here. That's what people should talk about. We live in the faith of hope and eternal life through Jesus. We don't need to live in fear. People need that now more than ever. Don't be afraid to talk about it, and don't be afraid to live for it. The believer is well assured through faith that there is another and a happy life after this one has ended. They have hope through grace of heaven as a dwelling place. In our Father's house there are many mansions whose builder is God. Many times we don't grasp that God is right here with us now. Through the Holy Spirit and His commands, this takes faith. Faith is for this world, and sight is for the next world. It is our duty to walk by faith until we live by sight. Amen. If you could bow with me for prayer. Praise your holy name, O Lord our God, for the glory without limit which awaits all who trust in the Lord Jesus as Savior. May we face the afflictions and difficulties that are inevitable in this world with godly grace, patient endurance, and unspeakable joy. Help us not to look at the circumstances of life with dread and fear, but rather may we view them as part of our destiny that you are weaving together for our good. We look forward with joy to the limitless glories which you have prepared for those that love you, no matter what difficulties and dangers we may be called upon to face. We lift our prayers for the peace of Jerusalem and in Ukraine. We pray that you give Yolan strength and healing. We pray that you give Pishti strength and support. We pray that you give Anita peace. We pray that Matilda's son will find peace in you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now for the benediction. Go now in peace, knowing that the miracles that God has produced in your life. Be assured that there are still more miracles to come. Bear witness to God's love to all you meet. In the name of the Creator, the Holy One, who resides with you always, go in peace. Amen. Thank you for being with us today at the Wharton Hungarian Presbyterian Church. We're located again, 83 Robert Street in Wharton, New Jersey. Sunday worship service is held at 10, 15 a.m. Next Sunday, we welcome the return of Taylor Silvestri with us, a student from the Princeton Theological Seminary. If you weren't with us last week or viewed her on YouTube, you really missed out. Check her out on YouTube. I think you'll find inspiration in her message. Be with us next week, and thank you. See you soon.